Did you know that right now, at this very moment, while you're watching this video, there's more than a billion insects around the world that are in the midst of courtship. Not looking for food, not looking for shelter, not laying eggs, not escaping a predator, just engaging in behaviors geared at enticing or encouraging another individual to mate with them. Whether it's a frenzied dance or flashes of light or nutritive gifts or aggressive postures and actions, all told, it can take a substantial amount of time and energy. But why even go to such lengths? In this video, we'll take a look at some of the ways that insects court one another, and we'll see if we can identify some of the underlying reasons for doing what they do. In our last video, we looked at various strategies that insects use to find each other for the purposes of mating. Behaviors like swarming, territorial defense, or pheromone signals. But once they do find each other, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're guaranteed to mate. Insects employ a wide range of sometimes elaborate rituals to decide whether or not to proceed. These rituals can often be explained by one of about six different hypotheses or ideas that shed some light on why these behaviors exist and how they get so flashy and what's in it for each side. First, let's start with the mate recognition hypothesis. At the most basic level, courtship can help ensure that the insect you've got eyes for is actually a member of your species. Mating with an insect of a different species almost never goes well. So courtship signals, whether flashes of light or distinct color patterns, can serve as a built-in compatibility check. You can imagine how beneficial this is. Once a species evolves a clear-cut specific courtship trait, it gains a huge advantage over those lacking such precision. Fewer mating attempts are wasted on mismatched partners. This streamlines reproduction. And over generations, natural selection can hone these signals even further, reinforcing their role as adaptive strategies that maximize reproductive success. Fireflies give us a wonderful example of this. When males are ready to mate, they glide into open areas where they can be easily seen and they emit pulses of light. But depending on where you live, there might be many different species of firefly hanging about. So just a flash of light might not be enough to signal to another firefly which species you are. As a result, each species has developed their own flash pattern. So males of Photinus pyralis, the common eastern firefly, they flash in a J-shaped flight path. They'll use a single quick pulse, lasting about half a second, followed by a few seconds of dark before repeating. Conversely, you have Photinus marginalis, the little gray firefly. It flies close to the ground and in a relatively straight flight path. They flash for about a third of a second and they repeat it at faster intervals compared to the common Eastern firefly. The females of each species also have species specific responses. This same idea applies to many chirping insects like field crickets where pulse rates and noise frequency differs between species. So this most fundamental need, simply finding a mate of the right species, has been a powerful driver of courtship behaviors. Next, we have the sensory exploitation hypothesis. Not all courtship behaviors initially arose strictly due to the needs of mating. In some species, it seems that males have been able to hijack a female's pre-existing sensory preferences. Preferences that arose for other purposes, like detecting food color or prey vibrations. Because the female's nervous system is already primed to notice those specific cues, a male that can tap into them can gain an automatic advantage. Even if the ability to tap into those cues has no direct link to male physical prowess or reproductive quality. Over time, this initial advantage can get refined into a more polished courtship ritual. Water mites of the genus Pneumania are a fun example of this. Female water mites often lie in wait for their prey, trying to detect their approach by the tiny ripples that the prey give off. 
Males exploit this feeding reflex by creating their own little water ripples that mimic prey movement. A female interested in what she thinks is approaching prey will then orient herself towards the vibrations. Only after she advances like that does the male shift to make an unmistakably mating-oriented signal. If she's receptive, then the courtship continues. So here, an unrelated sensory filter, namely the female's prey detection system, ends up becoming an integral part of the courtship ritual. Next, we have the good genes hypothesis. Sometimes, a courtship display is all about honesty. Can this mate truly handle the metabolic cost of producing vibrant coloration, or a loud call, or performing a complicated ritualistic dance? If a trait is metabolically or ecologically expensive, then it becomes an honest signal of overall genetic quality, because only the healthiest and most robust of mates can afford it. If the showiest mate is indeed the strongest and most disease resistant or best able to find and consume food, then by choosing them, a female, for example, would benefit her eventual offspring. Rhinoceros beetles are a poster child example here. Males wield massive horns for battles over mates. These are structures so large and resource intensive that they can even hinder mobility in some circumstances. Yet studies show that females strongly prefer males with the biggest and most elaborate of horns. So this handicap trait isn't simply eye-catching, it's actually an authentic indicator that the male's genetic makeup is robust enough to handle the costs associated with such an extravagant feature. That, in a nutshell, is the good genes hypothesis. But things aren't always so straightforward. Not all courtship signals arise through mutual cooperation and shared goals. You see, male reproductive fitness is often tied to the number of mating attempts they have. Remember, sperm is metabolically cheap to produce, so there isn't a lot of cost associated with trying to mate as often as possible. But it's often a different calculus for the females. Eggs are more metabolically expensive to produce and a female may only need to mate with one male to fertilize all of her eggs. So there's an advantage for the female to be really, really choosy. This discrepancy can spark something of an evolutionary arms race between the males indiscriminately pushing for mating access and the females resisting or screening suitors a little bit more rigorously. These competing goals can have fascinating impacts on courtship rituals and mating practices. In bedbugs, for example, female physiology has developed in such a way that makes conventional mating nearly impossible. Essentially, females don't have a functionally open or usable entrance to their reproductive tract. This then requires males to use other methods to ensure insemination. So males actually have to puncture the female's abdomen to deposit sperm more directly. Females have thus developed an organ called the spermilage that helps to contain and heal the wound. This arrangement speaks to deep-seated conflict. Females benefit from screening a males really, really carefully, while males often try to bypass that screening altogether. Praying mantises illustrate a different outcome to this conflict. In some species, a receptive female might allow a male to approach and mate unscathed, but if she's uninterested, or just really, really hungry, she could simply eat him, even before he's had a chance to mate. So, yeah, I mean, that's another way to limit attempts from undesirable males. This brings us to the next category of courtship rituals, called direct benefits, or sometimes the material benefits hypothesis. Here, the courtship dance or display revolves around providing immediate resources, like extra nutrition or quality oviposition sites. Females gain a direct boost to survival or reproduction, which can outweigh the potential costs of mating. This approach transforms courtship into a demonstration of tangible payoff. So you have male hanging flies that capture prey items to offer to prospective mates. As the female feeds on the gift, the male attempts to mate, 
The larger and more nutritious the male's gift of prey, the more time the female spends feeding, giving the male a longer mating window. Other examples include silk-wrapped prey gifts by male dance flies, or protein-rich spermatophores from male catadids. Here's the key in these courtship gifts. They provide immediate, tangible benefit to the female, while simultaneously boosting the male's chances of success in mating. Finally, we get to a circumstance that can lead to mating rituals spiraling out of control, called runaway selection. Runaway selection happens when the genes for a certain trait and the genes for preferring that trait become really tightly linked, reinforcing one another across generations. Because each generation inherits both the exaggerated feature and the preference for it, it can create an ever-intensifying cycle. A prime illustration of this comes from stock-eyed flies. Females in these species may have initially found broader eye stalks appealing, perhaps because they signaled a degree of male fitness or simply exploited a visual bias. As they mated with wide-eyed males, their offspring included sons with even longer eye stalks and daughters who further reinforced that particular preference. In the mid-90s, there were some lab experiments, and they found that when you selectively breed males for particularly elongated eye stalks, female preference evolves in tandem, completely irrespective of whether or not the eye stalks are associated with extra advantages like better immune function or better resource gathering ability. Over multiple generations, eye stalks can become disproportionately large and arguably detrimental to other aspects of life, like the ability to escape from predators. Yet, the trait persists, because the female preference continually chases the more extreme versions of it, fueling the development of a mating and courtship runaway scenario. Insect mating rituals and practices involve a diverse array of behaviors and traits, geared at making sure that insects are getting the mating opportunities that they're looking for. Often, there are multiple factors at play. A given ritual might have originated simply as a recognition cue, but over time, morphed into a more showy spectacle that robs or rewards participants in surprising ways. It's a core part of the history of insect morphological and behavioral change, and illustrates some of the forces that have shaped various insect species into what they are today. Well, that's enough for now. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.